Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Welcome to lesson number eight, ready for teaching on November 19. It's titled The New Testament Hope, and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 12. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your word we've read so many amazing and wonderful and comforting and hope-filled things. And as we continue that study this week, as we look at the hope that comes to the Christian because of what happened in the New Testament church, Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us each one wherever we are. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening alone, those who are listening in a group and those who are sharing with those around them. But particularly I'd like to pray for Orvin in San Gabriel in California or Viola in Kirikau and others who are listening there as well and Benjamin in Eugene, Oregon or Mathiro in Malawi in Africa and Clayton in the middle of the Atlantic on that little tiny group of islands and Bruce Matthew in Guyana in South America and Twiggy in Lusaka in Zambia and Alwyn in Jamaica and Lord, wherever we're listening, I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and that we will be blessed this day as we open your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Let's read that again, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Though writing in Greek, all the New Testament writers, except Luke, were Jews, and they, of course, approached the nature of human beings from the holistic Hebrew perspective, not from the Greek pagan one. Thus, for Christ and the Apostles, the Christian hope was not a new hope, but rather the unfolding of the ancient hope already nurtured by the patriarchs and prophets. For example, Christ mentioned that Abraham foresaw and rejoiced to see his day in John 8.56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Jude stated that Enoch prophesied about the second coming in Jude 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And the book of Hebrews speaks of the heroes of faith as having expected a heavenly reward that they would not receive until we receive ours. And we read that in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And... This statement would be meaningless if their souls were already with the Lord in heaven. By stressing that only those who are in Christ have eternal life, as we had in our memory text of 1 John 5, 11 and 12, John disproves the theory of the natural immortality of the soul. Truly, there is no eternal life apart from a saving relationship with Christ. The New Testament hope, then, is a Christ-centred hope, and the only hope that this mortal existence will one day become an immortal one.
Sunday, November 13. Hope Beyond This Life The ancient Greek historian Herodotus from the 5th century BC wrote about a tribe that, at a birth, began a period of mourning because they anticipated the suffering that the infant would face if it lived to adulthood. However alien to us the ritual might seem, there is some logic to it. Millennia later, an advertisement in America in the early 20th century read, Why live if you can be buried for $10? Life can be hard enough, we know, even if we believe in God and in the hope of eternity. Imagine, though, how hard it is for those who have no hope of anything beyond the short and often troubled existence here. More than one secular writer has commented on the meaninglessness of human existence, since we all not only die, but we also live with the realisation that we are going to die. And this realisation is what makes the whole project of human life, which is often hard and sorrowful in and of itself, seemingly null and void. One thinker referred to humans as nothing but hunks of spoiling flesh on disintegrating bones. Rather macabre, but again, it's hard to argue with the logic. Of course, in contrast to all this, we have the biblical promise of eternal life in Jesus, and that is the key. We have this hope in Jesus and what his death and resurrection offers us. Otherwise, what hope do we have? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 19. What is Paul saying here about how closely related Christ's resurrection is to the hope of our own resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins." Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Paul is explicit. Our resurrection is inseparably tied to Christ's resurrection. And if we don't rise, then it means that Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, then what? Your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, we read in verse 17. In other words, when we die, we stay dead, and forever too, and thus it all is meaningless. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.32, If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If our present existence as carbon-based protoplasm is all there is, and our three score and ten years, if we are fortunate, more if we don't smoke or eat too many hamburgers, are all that we get ever, we're in pretty tough shape. No wonder Ellen G. White adds in Sons and Daughters of God, page 349, Heaven is worth everything to us, and if we lose heaven, we lose all. And so to finish today, Think about how precious our hope and faith is. Why must we do all that we can, by God's grace, to preserve it? Monday, November 14. I will come again. Read John 14, 1-3. It has already been almost 2,000 years since Jesus promised to come again. How can we help others see that, despite the great length of time, which really doesn't matter, this promise is relevant even to our own generation, so long removed from the time when Jesus spoke it? 
John 14, beginning at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Four times in the book of Revelation, Jesus stated, I am coming soon. The first is in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. And then Revelation 22 and verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And verse 12, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. And verse 20, He who testifies of these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The expectation of his soon coming drove the mission of the apostolic church and filled the lives of uncountable Christians throughout the centuries with hope. But generation after generation has died, and this promised event has not yet occurred. And thus many are inquiring, how much longer will we have to preach that Jesus is coming soon? Have these words generated an unrealistic expectation? Well, let's have a look at Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Many Christians have complained about the long delay. We'll compare this with Matthew 25 verse 5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. But how do we, in fact, know that it is a long delay? What would have been the right time for Christ to have returned? Would it have been 50 years ago? 150? 500? What really matters is the biblical promise that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 Despite the long centuries since Jesus ascended, the promise of his coming remains relevant even today. Why? Because all that we have is our own short life. As we read in Psalm 90 and verse 10, The days of our lives are seventy years, and if by reason of strength they are eighty years, yet their boast is only labour and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Followed by an unconscious rest in the grave, as we read in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And then the final resurrection, without any later opportunity to change our destiny, as you read in Hebrews 9.27, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment... As far as each one of the dead is concerned, as stated in Lesson 3, because all the dead are asleep and unconscious, the second coming of Christ is never more than a moment or two after they die. For you, in your personal experience, as for all of God's people of every age, Christ's return is no more than a moment after your death. That's very soon, is it not? Every passing day brings us one day closer to the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. Though we don't know when he will come, we can be certain that he will, and that is what really matters. And so to finish the day, a pastor preached a sermon arguing that he didn't care when Christ returned. All he cared about was that Christ does return. How does that logic work for you, and how might it help if you were discouraged over Christ's having not 
yet returned. Tuesday, November 15, I will raise him up. In one of his miracles, Jesus fed 5,000 people with just a small amount of bread and fish, as recorded in John 6, verses 1 to 14. Perceiving that the multitude then intended to proclaim him king, in verse 15, Jesus sailed with his disciples to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But the next day, the multitude followed him there, where he delivered his powerful sermon on the bread of life, with special emphasis on the gift of everything everlasting life and that's recorded in John 6:22 to 59 read John 6:26 to 51 how did Jesus associate the gift of everlasting life with the final resurrection of the righteous John 6 Beginning at verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labour for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, What shall we do, that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they will say to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst." But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up, at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about him, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your father ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. In his sermon, Jesus highlighted three basic concepts in regard to eternal life. First, he identified himself as the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life 
to the world. And we read that in verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. We also read it in verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. By declaring that I am, the Greek ego eimi, the bread of life, as recorded in John 6, 35 and 48, Jesus presented himself as the great I am of the Old Testament. John 6 verse 35, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And verse 48, I am the bread of life. Jesus presented himself as the great I am of the Old Testament. You'll remember that in Exodus 3 verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Second, Jesus explained that everlasting life can be secured in him. He who comes to me and he who believes in me will have this blessing in verse 35. And finally, Jesus linked the gift of immortality with the final resurrection, assuring his audience three times, and I will raise him up at the last day. We read that in verse 40, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And verse 54, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus also gave this amazing promise. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever believes has eternal life. John 6.47 So the gift of eternal life is already a present reality. But this does not mean that the believer will never die. For the very expression, raise him up, in verse 40, presupposes coming back to life after one has died. The picture is clear. Without Christ, one does not have eternal life. But Even after accepting Christ and having the assurance of eternal life, we continue for now being mortal and therefore subject to natural death. At the second coming, Jesus will resurrect us and then and there he will give us the gift of immortality that was ours already. The gift is assured, not because of a supposed natural immortality of the soul, but rather because of the righteousness of Jesus that comes to us by faith in him. And so to finish today, dwell on the words of Jesus that if you believe in him, you have, as in right now, eternal life. How can this wonderful promise help you deal with the painful reality of our present, though only temporary, mortality? Wednesday, November 16, at the sound of the trumpet. The Thessalonians were convinced that eternal life would be granted exclusively to those who would remain alive until the second coming. As Ellen White writes in the Acts of the Apostles, page 258, they had carefully guarded the lives of their friends, lest they should die and lose the blessing, which they looked forward to receiving at the coming of their Lord. But, One after another, their loved ones had been taken from them, and with anguish the Thessalonians had looked for the last time upon the faces of their dead, hardly daring to hope to meet them in a future life. End of quote. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. 
How did Paul correct this misconception? 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning at verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. There is a historical tendency to read into the expression bring with him those who sleep in Jesus in verse 14 more than the text is saying. Many who accept the theory of the natural immortality of the soul suggest that Christ, at his second coming, will bring with him from heaven the souls of the righteous dead who were already in heaven with God. Those souls thus can be reunited with their respective resurrected bodies. But such an interpretation is not in harmony with the overall teachings of Paul on the subject. Read the words of this non-Adventist theologian on the real meaning of this verse. And this is from Geoffrey A. D. Weimar in the Baker Exegetical Commentary on the New Testament, page 319, published in 2014. The reason why the Thessalonian Christians can have hope as they grieve for the dead members of their church is that God will bring them, that is, he will resurrect these deceased believers and cause them to be present at Christ's return, such that they will be with him. The implication is that these deceased believers will not be at some kind of disadvantage at the parousia of Christ, but will be with him in such a way that they share equally with living believers in the glory associated with his return. End of quote. If the souls of the righteous dead were already with the Lord in heaven, Paul would not need to mention the final resurrection as the Christian hope. He could have just mentioned that the righteous were already with the Lord. But instead, he says that Those who sleep in Jesus, in verse 14, would be resurrected from the dead at the end of time. The hope in the final resurrection brought comfort to the grieving Thessalonians. The same hope can help us face with confidence the painful moments when the cold grip of death takes our loved ones from us. Thursday, November 17, The Everlasting Encounter Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 55. What mystery, as expressed in verse 51, is Paul explaining? 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Some popular preachers suggest that this mystery of 1 Corinthians 15.51 is the secret rapture of the church, which is to occur seven years prior to Christ's glorious second coming. 
In this secret rapture, faithful Christians are suddenly, quietly and secretly whisked off to heaven, while everyone else remains here wondering what happened to them. People might suddenly find themselves in a driverless car because the driver was raptured to heaven and all that remains is their clothes. The 16-volume best-selling Left Behind series, turned into four movies, promoted this false teaching, exposing millions to it. Of course, no biblical passage endorses such an artificial distinction between the rapture and the second coming. The mystery Paul is referring to is simply the transformation of the living righteous to join the resurrected righteous at Christ's second coming. This is the rapture. There is no secret rapture because the second coming will be visible to all living human beings and both the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living ones will occur at the sound of the trumpet at Christ's return, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. But Revelation 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, Amen. Christ's second coming will bring about the most amazing encounter ever. The living righteous are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, as we read in verse 52. At the voice of God, they are glorified. Now they are made immortal and with the risen saints are caught up to meet their Lord in the air. Angels, as it says in Matthew 24, 31, gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Little children, Ellen White says in The Great Controversy, page 645, are borne by holy angels to their mother's arms. Friends, long separated by death, are united, never more to part, and with songs of gladness ascend toward the city of God. End of quote. And so to finish today, this is such an amazing promise, something so different from anything that we have experienced that it's hard to grasp. But think about the vastness of the cosmos as well as the incredible complexity of life here. Creation itself testifies to God's amazing power. What does all this teach us about the power of God to translate the living and raise the dead at Jesus' second coming? Friday, November 18. The Romans, writes Stephen Cave in Immortality, The Quest to Live Forever and How It Drives Civilization, pages 104 and 105, were well aware of the Christians' belief that they would one day rise bodily from the grave and did everything they could to mock and hinder those hopes. A report of a persecution in Gaul in 177... AD records that the martyrs were first executed, then their corpses left to rot unburied for six days before being burned and the ashes thrown into the river Rhone. Now let us see whether they will rise again, the Romans are reported to have said. End of quote. This little object lesson in theological scepticism, however dramatic, is beside the point. It proved nothing about the biblical promise of the resurrection. The power who raised Jesus from the dead can do the same for us as well, regardless of the state of our body. After all, if that same power created and upholds the entire cosmos, he certainly could translate the living and resurrect the dead. Ellen White writes in the Acts of the Apostles, page 259, Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, Paul wrote. Many interpret this passage to mean that the sleeping ones will be brought with Christ from heaven. But Paul meant 
that as Christ was raised from the dead, so God will call the sleeping saints from their graves and take them with him to heaven. Precious consolation, glorious hope, not only to the church of Thessalonica, but to all Christians, wherever they may be. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, someone said, death wipes you out. To be wiped out completely, traces and all, goes a long way toward destroying the meaning of one's life. What hope, then, do we have against such meaninglessness in our lives? Two, how can we harmonise the need to grow toward perfection, as in Philippians 2, 12 and 16, with the fact that only at Christ's second coming will we receive an incorruptible and sinless nature, as we see in 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty to 55. Let's read Philippians 3, verse 12 to begin. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus." Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. And 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 55. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? And question three, how might we be able to help someone caught up in the idea of the secret rapture to see why this teaching is wrong? And four, read again 1 Corinthians fifteen twelve to 19. What in these verses presents such powerful evidence for the teaching that the dead are asleep as opposed to being up in heaven with Jesus? 1 Corinthians 15, beginning with 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men the most pitiable. What sense do these verses make if the righteous dead are indeed in heaven with Jesus now? Welcome to Inside Story. Inside Story this week is again read by Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Accepting the Word, Part 2, by Andrew McChesney. Eulalia Rashid completed her goal of reading the Bible from cover to cover on the Pacific island of Sepan in three years. Based on what she read, she began to keep the Sabbath and eat a plant-based diet. 
An alcoholic for 37 years, she told her family that Jesus had taken away her desire to drink. But she had colon cancer, a medical diagnosis that was made before she started reading the Bible. Then she came down with painful shingles. The two illnesses caused terrible suffering. But her attention was elsewhere. She did not understand why she felt as if she did not really know Jesus, even though she had read the entire Bible. She earnestly prayed. Abruptly, an inexplicable desire overcame her to call the Sepan Seventh-day Adventist Clinic. I'm sorry, but this is not concerning the clinic, Eulalia told the person who answered the phone. I need to talk with someone from church. I've read the whole Bible, but I'm still hungry and thirsty. A short time later, a young pastor showed up at Eulalia's door. The two headed off immediately. Eulalia felt as if she had known the pastor her whole life, and they began to study the Bible together. Eulalia asked to get baptised. About a month before the fall of 2019 baptism, Eulalia's terrible pain suddenly vanished. A doctor had told Eulalia that shingles was untreatable and she would suffer for many months. But now the pain was gone. She touched her stomach and sensed that something else was different. A short time later, the doctor pronounced her cancer free. Today, Eulalia is a missionary to her neighbours and family of four children and 13 grandchildren of Sepan. She prays for them as she tends her luscious green garden, which she calls her prayer garden. She gives the fruit of her labours to neighbours. A room in her house has been set aside as a worship place where Adventists and others gather on Sabbath evenings. Eulalia, now 66, has no doubt that the psalmist was correct when he said, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, from Psalm 119, verse 105. My hope and encouragement to other people is, Follow the word, she said. Jesus is the word. He is the way to everlasting life. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.